Thank you, Roseanne. Let's pray. Father, on this Harvest Sunday, as we gather, as we explore your word, may your Holy Spirit be moving amongst us. May you speak to us where we're at this morning, however we're feeling. We welcome you into this space and pray that you would have your way. Amen. Well, we've said it a few times already today, and we'll probably say it a few more times today. The words, thank you. It's a phrase that we throw around quite a lot. But how often do we actually mean it? Now, apparently, and I think this is wrong, the average person says thank you five times a day. I think that is far too little. And up to three of those occasions may not be sincere. I thought it would have been far more than five times. I thought it would, you know, because actually I've probably said it more than five times in my first hour of being awake. But that's what you do when you search Google. You find these random stats which are not scientifically proven. And those at Men's Breakfast yesterday know that I did it on a different thing. And yeah, take it with a pinch of salt, but hey. Another study showed that English speakers express thanks the most at 14 and a half times. Sorry, that doesn't even make sense. The English speakers, when they say thank you, 14 and a half percent of the time is, is genuine. And the other whatever the maths are, 85.5% is not genuine. Again, take that with a pinch of salt. It does serve as a purpose though, doesn't it, those two words? And even though that's a silly Google search of how many times a day does somebody say thank you, it serves as a purpose to introduce today's theme and the reading. Today is a day when we celebrate our Harvest Festival and we have just heard of the 10 healed of leprosy. At the start of our service, we sang about the goodness of God. We thanked him for his goodness to us. We thanked him for the people around us. And we thank him for this place. Now, if we only say thank you five times a day, those three things that we've already said thank you for means that we're over halfway through our quota for the day. It just doesn't make sense. Thank you, though, is two words that it doesn't take a lot to say. But it actually can mean so much to the person receiving them. As a church, I want us to be encouraged to say thank you to one another when we do something that actually is meaningful. As much as getting a cup of coffee. I walked through the door this morning and Wendy had a cup of coffee ready and I was like, thank you. And that was a sincere thank you, believe me. But it's those little things like saying thank you for making a coffee. Thank you, Steve, for cleaning the loose. Thank you for everybody who helped get the chairs out last night. They are all sincere thank yous. And it's really important that we get into that habit of saying thank you. Harvest is about thanking God for his goodness. It's about thanking him for his provision for us. Now, of course, harvest looks very different in different churches across the nation. There's harvest suppers. There's collections like we did last week outside church. There's harvest barn dances. I don't know which church would do that. And for those of you that were going to revolt that I didn't dance, my excuse is I was looking after my children and I'm sticking with it. (laughs) Had to get that in there. Or as one of the traditions in my curacy churches was, we had a meal up in an old chapel that was very, very cold. It had no heating. It had no running water. There was about six faithful people every Sunday afternoon for their service. But they used to get the community together. Now, the whole parish had 60 people in it. So essentially... Look around, that's the entirety of the parish that this church particularly was in. But they got that many people into their church for harvest. We had a meal, which was often a stew that had been cooked with fresh produce straight from the farm. And then there was an auction. And the ultimate auction lot at the end was Betty's Christmas cake. Not this Betty, but it was Betty's (laughs) Christmas cake that we hear had been matured in brandy for at least six months before it was sold. And it would always get more than 40 pounds for this cake. I mean, it was a a decent-sized thing. And you could smell the brandy, actually, as you did it. But it's how they do, you know, different churches celebrate harvest in different ways. Here, as sort of a, I suppose we're suburbs, aren't we? We don't have the farms around us. Obviously, I know Stopsley does have a farm in its parish. So we tend not to go down to thanking God for all of the different produce, But actually, we can thank God, even though there are no farms, we can still thank God for the farmers in this country that prepare our food so that we have enough on our plate. We say thank you a lot to each other, 
lights dimmed then, that was weird. Um, we say thank you a lot, but how often, how often do we actually say thank you to God? How often do we stop and say thank you to God? It's very easy to stand in a service as somebody, or as somebody's praying for you and go, thank you, Lord, thank you, thank you. But how often do we actually say thank you? We need to be a thankful people to the Lord and to each other. We need to share the provisions that we have to reflect the generous nature and character of God. And especially this year, I believe we need to be really generous for those of us that can to one another. Because there will be people in our community who are in need. Just this last week, I was talking to, to Joe, the head teacher at Bushmead Primary, and she was saying how many of the families in Bushmead Primary, with the rise in the energy, have been pushed below that poverty line. Those of us that can need to share. When we were talking to Takor last week after the food bank collection, he said that food bank donations have dropped significantly. It's understandable, friends, and I'm not trying to make us feel guilty if we can't contribute. It is understandable, as our, all of our purses are tightened, that obviously one of the things that goes is donations. There are less donations being collected at supermarkets. Even this week, I think it was on the BBC, people were saying food bank donations have reduced. There will be people in our community who need us to share, and that is one way that we can celebrate the harvest. We might not be producing all this produce. Though Trevor's pumpkin last night was incredible. It was about this big that he'd grown. Some of us will do that, but some of us also can share the, in the goodness of God and share that he has provided for us so that we can share with others. Two weeks ago, Dean spoke to us about the lost coin and the lost sheep. And in those two parables, the lost is one and the rest were safe. The coin was lost, the rest were safe. The sheep was lost, the 99 was safe. But in this parable, here in Luke 7, to us, not parable, in Luke 17, it's the other way around. One person says thank you and shows gratitude to God, yet the other nine go on their way without as much as a second thought. And what makes this particularly interesting is that the one who returns is a foreigner. He is a Samaritan. Don't know what's going on with the lights. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, right, it's not the lights at all. So when the sun goes down, I'm not... No, never mind. Um, so where, where are we? <laughs> Sorry. We have Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. He's traveling along the border between Samaria and Galilee, essentially where we, what we call the West Bank today. The group that are coming towards Jesus, there are 10 of them coming towards Jesus. They're not hostile. That might have been the first thing that the disciples and Jesus will have felt when they saw this group approach them because that, as it is today between Samaria and Galilee, it was, da it was dangerous. They might, their first reaction might have been, oh no, what are they going to do? Are they going to mug us or are they going to rob us? But what they did do was actually they went and they asked for help. Now they kept their distance. The typical reaction in, the, in Jesus' time to lepers would be, don't come near me. Look at their hands, look at their fingers, look at their face. Get away from me quickly. And that's why the men stay at a distance from Jesus. They knew that they couldn't approach Jesus, but they still know that even without a physical touch from the Savior, they would be healed. Jesus doesn't touch the men as he has done before when we've seen him put mud in the eyes of the blind, when we've seen him touch people, when the lady who is hemorrhaging, she touches his robe. There is no physical contact in this, in this story. What does Jesus do though? He says, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they go, they are cleansed. Jesus is essentially giving these 10 men a test of faith. Because it's usual in the culture of Jesus' time that they would only go and see the priests after they had been cured. Because in Jesus' time, as we probably know, the lepers would be cast out of the city. They'd have to stay outside the walls and they were basically outcasts of society. So they weren't allowed to go and see the priests until they had been healed. But in this case, these lepers that come to Jesus, he's saying, go and see the priests. And they've not even been healed. But it's when they go to the priest that they are cleansed, they are cured. And then we see the one come back. We see the Samaritan come back. 
He runs up to Jesus. He falls down at his feet. And he says, thank you. He says, thank you to Jesus. This, friends, in many ways is another way of Jesus showing that the boundaries are being moved. That he is saying, he is the Messiah for all, not just the Jews, not just those that have the right theology, that have the right doctrine, that do the right thing. Jesus in this passage is showing us that he is Messiah and Savior for all. And then he says to the Samaritan, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The leper's faith has made him well. He's no longer a leper. That label that had been put on him is gone. He is now a Samaritan man who is fully healed. Do we, friends, have that faith to believe that we will be made whole and healed and made well through Jesus? It's when the man returns and Jesus says, rise and go, your faith has made you well. That's the bit we would focus on. Luke provides no description of a physical healing. We assume that his, his leprosy has gone. But there is also perhaps a healing of a much deeper sort that goes on in this passage. Your faith has made you well can also be translated as your faith has saved you. So if we read it like that, rise and go, your faith has saved you. Imagine if we were to hear those words from Jesus today. Dean, rise and go. Your faith has saved you. Helen, rise and go. Your faith has saved you. It puts a slightly different perspective on it. Jesus isn't interested in the Samaritan's faith. He doesn't ask any questions about the faith. All we know is that it's a man who returns is a Samaritan. We don't know his theology. It's not relevant to Jesus. We don't know his political views. It's not relevant to Jesus. All we know is that he's a Samaritan and that he has recognized that it is Jesus who has healed him. He recognizes the gift from God that he has received when he sees and experiences it. So why, in the 21st century, do we put so many barriers up between each other? Why do we put barriers up in the church, in this church, over whether which side of the arguments we agree on and disagree on? Why do we put barriers up between the churches in the nation? After all, God wants a united church. We are part of the church of God. Back in the very early church, the reason the West and the Eastern church have split is over one iota, the letter I in Greek. That is why there is a split between the Western and the Eastern church to this day. It's over homoousios or homoousios, and I can't remember the whole discussion, but it's over one iota. The Samaritan comes back, and he says thank you. He recognizes the gift. And in that exchange, Jesus shows us that faith and gratitude are very closely related. Faith without gratitude is not faith at all. But there is also something very life-giving about gratitude. Indeed, in our own liturgy, we speak of the gratitude we have for what Jesus does for us on the cross. We celebrate Holy Communion when we say the words, It is right to give thanks and praise. And then it continues, excuse me, it is indeed right, our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise. When we hear those words, we shouldn't just think, oh, we've started communion. Those very words that we say should challenge us. They should challenge our very being to become people that actually can say we follow those words, that we do give thanks and praise in all that we do. We should take the time to contemplate it wholeheartedly, trying to understand it, pray in it, so that it might become a part of us, so that then it becomes part of our everyday Christian living and not some words that are said by me or a visiting priest when we come to celebrate Holy Communion. It should be something that we live out every day, 
We need to learn to be thankful in the mundane, to be thankful in the ordinary, to be thankful in the trivial, to be thankful in the everyday. Indeed, the very word Eucharist means thanksgiving. So when we say the Eucharistic prayer, it is essentially a prayer of thanksgiving. How thankful are we in our own lives to Jesus and to the Lord and to God for what they do for us? Perhaps this morning you might be thankful for something that's happened. Have you actually said thank you? I know I haven't. There's things that I need to say thank you for. So I think that the Samaritan who returns in this passage is an example that we can follow. In Jesus' time, he'd have been judged a heretic by most people. But he epitomizes the godly life and attitude that we should and could be working towards. He demonstrates a faith that lays hold on God, that cannot and will not remain silent in response to what God has done in his life. Publicly, spontaneously, and joyfully, he directs thanksgiving to God. Now, I should say that being grateful is not a prerequisite to healing. It's not a prerequisite to the healing here because all of them are cleansed. All of them are healed. But it's the Samaritan that comes back. And when he comes back, there is that turning around, that, probably that physical turning around from going to see the priest, turning around and going back. And I actually wonder, what did the other nine say? Well, where are you going? What are you doing? Well, I'm going to say thanks to Jesus. He's healed us. Well, why do we need to... We know, what was that conversation? We're not party to it. We don't know. But where, what happens to the other nine? Do they just go about their way and think he's strange for going back and saying thank you? But he turns around and he comes back to Jesus. And that carries deep theological meaning, that turning around. Because it is describing in many ways that person as, turn, as the whole person turning around initiated by God's graceful work, redirecting their whole orientation towards God. And then Jesus says, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Not just the physical healing, but the very act of turning around and going back has healed the whole person. That healing, friends, is available for us too today. If we are willing to go to that, to get to that point where we say enough is enough, not to steal a line of a political movement, but enough is enough to turn around and go back to Jesus and say, thank you, Lord, for healing me. Do you, friends, do I have the faith to believe that that could happen today? I hope the answer is yes, but it is a challenge. It is a challenge and yes. This morning, I truly believe that the Lord is wanting his people to return to him and be thankful. Despite everything that is going on in the nation, despite everything that is going on in the world, we can still be thankful. A few years back during Lent, and I think it's carried on, Christian A challenged the church to count their blessings. Each day they gave you a different thing. Or thank God for the food on your table. Thank God for the money in your bank. Thank God for being able to get up this morning and going to work. Thank God that you can get up and you can go to church without fear of persecution. And the idea was that you counted that up over the 40 days of Lent. And it was staggering how thankful that we can be when we actually put our mind to it. Because it's very easy in this world to get sucked into the commercial and capitalist mindset that if we don't have the latest gadget, we're inadequate. That's one I've got to learn on. That if we don't have the perfect body, again, I've got to learn on that, then we're some sort of lesser person. That's what marketing is all about. That's what commercialism is all about. It's about trying to get us to part with our cash, to buy stuff that friends we really don't need. Because guess what? It ain't coming with us at the end. And in this day and age, the fact that you, know, you buy a fridge and two years later it's broken. There's a wonderful meme going around Facebook of a 1960s fridge saying, I will outlive everything. There's a lot of truth in that. We can still be thankful. We don't need the perfect house. We don't need the perfect friends. We don't need the perfect family. Because the perfect house, the perfect friends, and the perfect family, quite simply, don't exist. We can still be thankful with what we have. What matters at the end of the day is that we have a faith in the Lord Jesus. And that we have the faith that he can heal us from the inside out. 
You have a faith and he will heal us in so many ways that we don't even know we need healing. Yet he knows that we need that healing. And when we get into that mindset of being thankful and grateful to God, we can live with what we have. We can be content with where things are. And when we're in that place, that is when we can hear Jesus say to us, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Or rise and go, your faith has saved you. Whichever word you prefer. So going back to the Eucharistic prayer, the Thanksgiving prayer, essentially it is telling us to live out a thankful life. It's very easy to stand here and say this, but I know, friends, that putting it into practice is so much harder to live out in the everyday. But what we can see is when we look at this story, when we start peeling back the layers, we can see that this grants us a glimpse of what gratitude can look like. And that brings it all the way back to harvest which is essentially what harvest is about. It's saying thank you to God. Thank you for his provision for us. Thank you for what you did for us on the cross. So I want to say this morning, what if we are to listen out for the instructions that Jesus has given us? He's probably not going to say to you this morning, well, go and see the priests. I mean, you're welcome to come and see me if you like, but he's probably not going to be saying, go and see the priests. What is Jesus saying to you this morning? What instruction is he giving you that sounds so strange that you've been parking it to one side and not doing it? He says to the lepers who who have leprosy, go and see the priests. What is Jesus saying to you this morning? What is Jesus saying to the church this morning? The church here in, in Bushmead, what is he saying to us as a congregation What do we need to do that sounds so strange? That perhaps sounds terrifying? And then what's holding us back from doing it? Nothing held the Samaritan back from going to Jesus and then running back from the priest to say thank you. What is stopping us doing what we need to do? If we get to that point, friends, where we're willing to turn around and return to Jesus to fall at his feet and say, thank you. Hear him say to you, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. 